Good morning. We're glad you're with us. I'm Jean Martin, a member of the Community Forum Committee of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our fifth forum of the winter spring season. We appreciate your joining us. We organize these forums as a congregational service to the community to support personal reflection and social action and to encourage individual and collective growth for all. Today's discussion is on the greening of liberal religion. I'd like to introduce Jim Rich, who actually has not rejoined us, another committee member and coordinator of today's forum. Um, Jim will introduce the topic and our speakers. However, he's not there right this minute. So let me <laughs> do what I can do. Here he is. Gene, it's showtime for you. I don't have the script in front of me, but Jim, if you can turn on your audio and your video, you're on. There. Yes, we'd like you to introduce the speakers. That's supposed to be the video, but it's not showing. You don't want to watch my picture anyway. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Just go ahead and introduce the speakers. Greetings and welcome to today's forum discussion, everybody that's with us. Our topic today is the greening of liberal religions. We are called to restore and protect the earth. What part do echo spirituality, creation care, and environmental justice play in Unitarian uh, you, liberal Christian and Jewish thought. Have we really engaged our hearts or theology on the environment? How can we prioritize environmental impact in our home, work, and community? We are fortunate to have two speakers who are well-versed in this topic, Reverend Randy uh, Partain and Rabbi Ellen Bernstein. Randy is the called minister uh, for our congregation. He recently came to us from Tapestry UU Church in Spring, Texas, where he was a founding minister. The vote to call him was 99% positive. I was part of the 99%. He has been proving we were right. Randy earned a Doctor of Music Arts degree from Rice University, was adjunct, uh, professor of music at Sam Houston State and led music and performance programs in various churches. His many interests include our ecology, the subject of today's forum. He is gradually exploring Cleveland's emerald necklace as he settled into his new home. Ellen is a pioneer in the field of religion and ecology. She founded Shamay Adama Keepers of the Earth in, in 1988, an author and echo theologian. She writes and teaches on the intersection of Judaism, Bible and ecology, and is the author of several books, most notably, The Splendor of Creation and The Promise of the Land, an ecologically centered Passover Haggadah. She created the first ecological guide for the new year of the trees. That's the Jewish holiday to be Shabbat. I apologize for our pronunciation and has popularized the holiday as an ecological festival through large scale interspiritual arts festivals. She is the advisory group member for the Yale Forum on a on religion and ecology. Ellen and, and Randy will each make a brief statement about our topic, then they'll have a conversation. We look forward to hearing from you. Ellen and Randy, the microphones are yours. I, I think I'm supposed to lead off, right, Ellen? Right. Okay. Please. I'll, and I'll make this pretty brief because I know we're, we're, we want people to have a chance to engage. So I'll kind of condense this a little bit. Um, Unitarian Universalism, I do think was kind of ahead of the curve as far as ecological sensitivity uh, and its, its connection with spirituality in the US. 
of course, religion and and, uh, and ecology go back a long way when you start looking at the pagan roots of a lot of religious traditions. There was a much more sense of oneness with nature in, in all of people's lives. But um, in the 1800s, the, there was a group of folks called the Transcendentalists, and a lot of those people, the poets and writers and thinkers that were part of the transcendentalist movement were connected with the Unitarian faith tradition. And the Unitarian faith tradition was known for being very logical, very intellectual, very stoic, unemotional. And, uh, and this group of transcendentalists said, this is not what spirituality should look like. Spirituality should be emotional and it should touch the heart. And it's not just in our heads. It's about you know, it's about that connection between heart and mind and our connection with everything else. Eastern religions were starting to, to be more well known in the West. And so Hinduism specifically influenced transcendental thought. And a lot of them found a sense of spiritual transcendence. They found a sense of, of um, spiritual uplifting and spiritual renewal being in nature. And so they started to care a lot more about that relationship between people and nature, not just as uh, how we get resources, but as how we engage as part of it, as being part of the whole of, of existence and being one little piece of this larger ecosystem. And that thought has influenced Unitarianism uh, throughout its history. When the Unitarians and the Universalists got together in the early 60s, that coincided with a, a neo-paganism kind of revival or influence from mostly England into the United States. And as pagans sought places to be safe, because even today there's a lot of persecution in some places uh, of neo-pagans, Unitarian Universalist churches wound up being safe places for them to gather, for them to express their beliefs, their connection with nature, their earth-centered theologies. And in the, by the time we got to 85, there had been enough of this pagan presence within Unitarian Universalism that the coven of Unitarian Universalist pagans was created in 85. And they are still going strong today. I am a member of, the, of that group. And, um, and there's a lot of crossover between that earth-centered spirituality and what we do with the rest of our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition. Um, we also have green sanctuary programs where Unitarian Universalist congregations kind of commit to making their spaces more environmentally friendly. But we were a little bit ahead of the curve, I think, as a, as a faith tradition. Um, and maybe we can talk about this a little more, but it, it wasn't until 66, 1966 that, um, this paper was published in the journal Science that basically said that Western Christianity had done a real disservice to nature and our relationship with nature and that, that Christianity bore a burden of guilt for the environmental crisis. So there was a lot of different reactions to, to that paper by um, Lynn White. And uh, we might talk about that a little bit more. I think that might have been one of the things that sparked ecological interest in a real serious sense in a lot of liberal Christian congregations. But let me turn things over to Ellen so that we can hear a little more about her background and, and her, the lens through which she's looking. Great, well, thank you so much, Randy. I'm really excited to, to talk to you because um, I, I was also really, my, myself, I was in, influenced by the transcendentalists. So what I'm going to do to begin with is just talk about my own journey. I founded the first National Jewish Environmental Organization 35 years ago. Um, and um, so I just want to give, so, so I'm going to be talking personally to begin with. And then later on in the Q&A, we can talk more about what's going on in the Jewish world specifically. But my own journey is... I didn't have, uh, so I was born Jewish. I grew up in a, um, an assimilated Jewish home where uh, we just went to services for Rosh Hashanah, that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and uh, so I really had no, no Jewish connection, you know, very minimal Jewish connection uh, growing up. 
I was lucky enough to start studying religion when I was in high school. And I was very attracted to the transcendentalists at that time. Also, I was totally a nature kid. I was outdoors. I, I, I remember my cousins telling me that I used to talk about spirituality when I was 10 years old. And, and so I always had this relationship with nature. And um, where I went to school, we were required to take uh, religion classes. And so even from the time I was 15, each semester we took a, a different uh, religion class. So from a, like um, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, um, Old Testament and New Testament. Um, so that was really where I became interested in religion to begin with. And, and I was a pretty troubled uh, adolescent. And um, I felt that all these world religions were speaking to the issues that were most important in my heart. And I also took an environmental studies class when I was in high school. And we went out and did uh, river studies with, we took hat kits, uh, these little science kits out into the rivers and we would test the different pollutants and the oxygen content. And um, so that was my beginning of, of the connecting religion and ecology. And this is the late sixties. And, um, and I, uh, so I still, you know, I was becoming interested in Judaism. Um, I went to UC Berkeley uh, to the first, one of the first environmental studies programs in the United States. And, um, and when I got out of school, um, I started, uh, I started teaching biology and ecology in a high school and my students weren't very interested in the science. So I myself had, had studied these transcendentalists and what I would read, the, the kind of reading I did was all in the great nature writers. So I devised a curriculum of people like Annie Dillard and um, uh, God, I'm, I'm having a, a, a moment right now. Anyway, all these different nature writers uh, I was teaching and um, my kids went crazy. They loved it. And also I took them on wilderness river trips and there was just a, a whole difference in their demeanor and their attitude towards nature once they were reading um, great nature literature and having an experience of what it is to be in nature. So at the same time, I started getting interested in Judaism. I was on the spiritual quest for myself. And um, as a literary person, I started reading the Bible with um, the Hebrew Bible with a, a friend of mine who was sort of a quasi rabbi with a PhD in literature. And, um, and we, um, oh, <laughs> and we, were we started in the beginning and I had not really read the Bible at all before this. And we, we started with Genesis and uh, Genesis one, the creation story. And I had this very strong ecological background and I was so stunned that all to be reading Genesis one and to have all these ecological insights jumping out at me um, just from Genesis one. And, and uh, just to give you one example, um, it, uh, so Genesis one is the seven days of creation. And at the end of each day, a different aspect of the natural world is created on each day. And at the end of each day, it says, and God said that it was good. And, um, and good from, uh, Maimonides, a great, uh, Jewish philosopher talked, talked about the word good meaning having integrity. So there was this whole notion that everything that was created in the natural world was created for a purpose. It had integrity. God, God saw that it was good. It mattered. You know, we, we're not supposed to mess with it. And all of creation is created before human beings are created. So I wrote an entire book just on, I, so this was my entry into, into Judaism and ecology. And ultimately I ended up writing a whole book on just looking at Genesis one from an ecological perspective. There's lots more wisdom in there than, than just what I told you. So anyway, um, I, so at that time, I, 
uh, I started looking for a Jewish environmental organization, a place where I could hang my hat, uh, where I could feel at home Jewishly. And I looked for five years and I didn't find anything. And I ended up moving to Philadelphia. Um, I had been in Berkeley and I ended up moving to Philadelphia. And in, the, in Philadelphia, it's a very strong reconstructionist uh, community, uh, reconstructionist Judaism community. And, um, and when you are, so I would ask people, uh, is there a Jewish environmental organization? This was my question that I'd been asking people for five years. And people, if you know Reconstructionists, people would say to me, no, there isn't, and it, you have to start one. <laughs> so it's sort of like the person that asked the question has to take responsibility for, for the work. So that's what happened. I started uh, Shomri Adama, the first Jewish environmental organization uh, in 1988. And I just wanna say two other things and then we can go on and chat more together. Um, but I just wanna talk a little bit about the trajectory of my own work, which was really to then start looking at the Hebrew Bible and other Jewish texts from an ecological pr perspective and create kind of a, um, an ecological foundation for how to read Te Jewish texts from an ecological perspective. Um, and so we, we wrote books for rabbis and Jewish educators um, because, because the you know, from my perspective, the truth is, is that, that the Bible in particular, the Hebrew Bible in particular, and, and some Jewish texts have a profound ecological dimension. It's just that it's been hidden for some of the things that Randy talked about before around also how pagans have been treated in the past um, and just how the whole notion of our relationship to nature hasn't been taken seriously for a variety of reasons. And so from my perspective is this, all of these kind of ecological ideas went underground and but they are there. And it's like, you just have to know how to read the Bible from an ecological perspective in order to see those ideas come alive. So, so, so I have one of my trajectories is, has been textual and really looking at, at the Bible primarily. And the other has been about festivals and creating holidays and celebrations, um, uh, again, from an ecological perspective. Um, and I was particularly excited, Randy, to hear about your background in music because um, I'm, I really believe um, that art and that all the arts are really important in this whole ecological conversation. And you very rarely hear people talk about this, um, about the necessity of the arts to awaken people's hearts and for, from my perspective and the sort of a pet peeve that I've had um, with the secular environmental movement is just that it's too much telling people what to do. And, you know, it, just this kind of moralizing without, uh, without engaging people's hearts enough. And, and it really worries me. Um, so anyway, I'll stop there, but that's the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I actually have a copy of the Promise of the Land uh, that I've been able to, to look at. And I noticed that some of the songs, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's got some really beautiful artwork in here too. But I noticed that some of the songs, you have both the traditional song, but you also have some goddess-centered language, some earth-centered language that are alternates. And so you provide both options if oh. people want to explore things. It's like, here's the history of this song. And here's another set of words that, that might reflect a more sensitivity toward our connection with, with nature. Did you script those words? Did you find them? Did you work in collaboration with someone? How did you reframe that music? Um, well, the music, there are two, I think you're, there are two pieces that you're talking about in particular. Um, and one of them, a friend of mine wrote, she, so I, uh, so I, I did most of the commentary of the Haggadah myself. 
And then I engage some other people who um, are musicians or, or, you know, have more of that capacity than I do. So uh, a friend of mine wrote one of the pieces and another, another piece that was more from a feminist perspective was had been done earlier. And I just got the rights to use that. Yeah. I think it's great. I think you're right about art. And one of the, I think one of the things that, um, I think his name was Lynn White. Lynn White. Yeah. Lynn White. I think one of the things that uh, that was effective about his uh, his critique of American Christianity and saying that Christians bore the burden of guilt for how they were treating the environment like it belonged to them and it was just a resource. Um, part of the advantage of that was he was talking to people that were theologians and were able to to think at that level. But the disadvantage was. It was that was in the head too. That was not really a heart-centered thing. It was this kind of shame-based, didactic um, approach that that didn't really grab people and say this is an important part of who you are as a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. And so it made it easy to push back with kind of intellectual arguments. And a lot of people did. A lot of different denominations and, and faith traditions did. So I, what, can I can I just respond yeah. to that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so when I was in college, so the, 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 the article we're talking about, the, this uh, historian's name is Lynn, Lynn White, and he wrote this article called the ecologic, no, the, um, the historical roots of the ecologic crisis, I'm pretty sure was the title of the article, which was, came out in 1967. And um, we read that article when I was in college. Um, and in, so actually even more than, than the article, what was how that article was received and interpreted. And what happened with that article is many people thought that, um, what he was saying was, yes, it was a critique of humanity's place in Judeo-Christian tradition, but a lot of people just took it as uh, looked at Genesis one, the, the uh, chapter that I'm so interested in. And they looked at Genesis one verse 28, which says, and humanity will have dominion over the earth and all the creatures. Um, and, and, and what, what other people said that that meant after reading Lynn White was that um given that we're given dominion, that means that we can exploit all of creation and that's what we've been doing. And, um, and in response to Lynn White, there were probably millions of articles written. I mean, at least, at least thousands and thousands. Um, and, and entire books were written in response to this, uh, this whole question. And, and in, in particular, exploring Genesis uh, 128. And for me, so, so really it, it came out bo both ways. There were people that totally, uh, were felt guilty. There were tons of theologians, ministers who felt guilty that, yeah, in fact, uh, that's what the Bible says that we're given dominion. It means we're supposed to exploit nature. <laughs> and there were rabbis that said that too. And like, they were totally embarrassed and and then what they've said was you know let's forget about genesis one we'll just look at genesis two where it talks about you know stewardship and um but then there were all these other people who said that's a ridiculous reading of dominion and and dominion is uh is about that the, in fact this is our first call to elevate nature and to take care of nature and to be De God's deputy, like to, to respond in the most positive way we could to nature. Because after all, everything God created had been good up until humanity was created. It, it just seemed ridiculous that, you know, that God would have created humans to exploit what God had just created as good. So, um, so anyway, that was a big piece, also a motivator for me to start my work, the organization, because it, and it's still being taught. All this stuff is still being taught in in environmental studies classes and geography classes. And people want to blame the Judeo-Christian tradition for the environmental crisis. And it's 
what, what's so painful to me about it is you, if you read Dominion in a positive way, instead of, I wrote an article that came out in Tikkun just six months ago or something. I said, Dominion, it does not mean domination. That's not, you know, that's not what it means. And it's, but everybody kind of wants to make it mean that. So um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. And I know that there is a thread of Jewish thought and that, that also influences Christian thinking about the stewardship of the earth that basically says we're here to manage it. And our goal is to keep it as uh, in as much as possible the way that it was created so that it stays the way God intended for it to be rather than it's here for us to exploit. And so there's a, more of a sense of responsibility that goes along with that dominion. It's more of a, it's more of a sense of, you know, you're, you're caring for somebody's baby now. That doesn't mean you right. can exploit the baby. It right. means that you have a responsibility now to, to care for it and to love it and to be in relationship with it. Um, right. One of the things you had asked when we were talking before was about whether, uh, because our our congregation here in Cleveland has a, a strong permaculture um, group, and we've got a permaculture garden. We've got a group of people that are very earth centered in the way that they're thinking. So when we do any kind of improvements or repairs to the building, we've got some voices of people that are saying let's use ecologically sound uh, materials and and sources and all of that. Um, and you were asking, is that just unique to this place, or is that throughout Unitarian Universalism, I would hesitate to say that anything is true of all Unitarian Universalist congregations, but there is a, uh, I think there is a pretty strong connection to the ecology and that side of our spirituality in the Unitarian Universalist faith tradition. Mm -hmm. I was a little fascinated though, when we were talking about the greening of liberal religion, because if we look at some very, very ancient religions like Jainism, for instance, that has influenced some, some of our thinkers that we really respect and revere, Jainism has always had this sense of uh, doing no harm to, to the natural world and being in peaceful relationship. I'm wondering if in your work, you have gone back to some of these ancient traditions and ways of thinking, or if what you've been doing seems like it's creating something new. I'm wondering how, how the ancient and the, the innovative kind of relate with your work. Does that well, question make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and, and for me, the whole point of my work has been to try to illuminate the parts of the tradition, the, the ecological parts of the tradition. So let me just talk a little bit more about that as opposed to um, I, I wouldn't have started this organization if it was about bringing, if it was just about putting a modern take on top of the tradition, I wouldn't, that wouldn't, that's not who I am. So, I mean, that's not really an interest of mine, but what was interest, what, what kept me motivated and interested is in fact that, well, I believe that, all traditions like that are based in the land that have that are going to have a future have to be thinking about our relationship with nature. It, and again, I just feel like the problem has been how the tradition has been received and and how, you know, in Judaism, right, you have the, the Hebrew Bible and then on top of it, you have rabbinic interpretation over 2000 years. So usually Jews read through the eyes of the rabbis um, or, or with the eyes of the rabbis. And, for, and what happened though with the rabbis in ancient Judaism was that the Israelites, the, the Jews were expelled from the, from the land that they lived on, right? The, the temple was destroyed and the Jews had to leave and they, they went to Babylonia and all over, right? And, and then they, they didn't have a land of their, they never had a land of their own for 2000 years. And um, so people talk a lot about the trauma of having been expelled from the land. And also, so there's not as much in the rabbinic traditions, like in the Talmud and the Midrash, there's not as much about our relationship to land 
but in the Bible, there's a ton. So I did this whole, um, I did this whole investigation of just the word Eretz, which can be translated as either earth or land. And I, I tracked it right through the entire Hebrew Bible. And it was, it occurs over 2000 times and that's a lot. And a lot of times what happens is, you know, you, you're familiar with the phrase justice, justice, you shall pursue. It's a very common phrase that's used in, in Jewish uh, circles. It's from the Bible, right? But it says justice, justice, you shall pursue so that you may live long on the land or so that you may lo- live long on the land or the, the earth. And the same thing with honor your father and mother, honor your father and mother so that you may live long on the, on the land. And there are all of these phrases that, that we've cut off the last part so that you may live long on the land. It's like, we don't, we're so um, unconscious of the value of the earth, of the land. You know, we, we walk on it, we step on it, we trash it, you know, and that we even, you know, um, dump the last phrase. Anytime we see the word land in the Bible, it's like it's nothing. It's just yeah. right. It's, so, so that's what I've been trying to do is retrieve. It's really a, a work of retrieval. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I believe that, that the ancients, the ancient Israelites had a strong ecological consciousness um, and that the Bible reflects that. But most people, again, I mean, so many people have, you know, they're, they're, they're reading the Bible from a very human centered perspective there. And they, they don't know how to read ecologically. And if you don't have that background, it's not going to jump out at you. So we bring our own, right. We bring our own perspectives to, um, to the way that we read. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that, that's true of most faith traditions that have a scripture and the faith traditions that don't, you know, we are reading through our own personal lenses whenever we look at something. I think that's one of the reasons that Unitarian Universalists may have a a broader sense of that responsibility than some uh, faith traditions, because there is such accessibility now of writings from so many cultures and so many different thinkers and so many spiritual traditions that we incorporate. When we were talking about the transcendentalists, when they were looking at Hinduism, it was it was not necessarily easy for them to learn from Hindu teachings. You know, there was there was a lot of work that they had to do. And now we've got all of this knowledge at our fingertips. And so we can see and and receive wisdom from so many other sources and go back to some of that. We can retrieve things from some of those ancient traditions so much easier. But I know one of the questions that is going to come up and one of the questions we talked about is why is there resistance and where is there resistance to caring for the 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 earth, the land? Um, Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have found in some Christian circles is that there is this this hyper focus on afterlife. So Mm -hmm. this life is is transient and what people are focused on is going to heaven or what's going to happen when you die. And that's you know, this is like the the prologue to something else. And so there's, it's difficult to focus on what's happening to this planet because that's not their ultimate goal. Their spiritual focus is not physical at all. And so I think there's some resistance in that respect that, that tying spirituality to ecology is um, missing the point for their faith. And I know that there are some people that we've talked about that want this sense of superiority and their spiritual identity as human beings is like over no, everything I'll, else. I'll say it and I, I can see it has, and on it and nothing happens. You know what? I think it's time to just let Ken do it. <laughs> is is there other is there other pushback that you have seen from uh from Ellen people of faith? Ellen and Randy. Yes. I want to thank both of you for excellent really excellent presentations we learned a lot we could listen to you all afternoon long but we got started late and we 
according to my screen, we have 34 uh, attendees, some of whom may have questions. So it's time for questions and answers. So I'll turn it over to Laura Imbornani. Uh, I had trouble with that. And Ken Fries, who were members of our foreign committee and co-chairs of our Q&A session. Uh, use your Q&A button on the computer. Uh, we'll get you to the Q&A screen. Uh, type or copy your questions in and click the submit button. And Ken, uh, Laura and Ken will question, choose the questions and uh, relay, they, relay them to the speakers. Uh, at the risk of taking too much time, before I start, I'd like to ask Ellen and Randy a personal questions. What could I do to promote awareness of the ec ecology within UUCC and or in the greater Cleveland community? Have any answers? You want to take a first crack at that, Ellen? What could you specifically do, yes. Jim? Well, I'd need to know a little bit more about you before I could tell you, but because basically the way that I feel is that everybody can contribute in some way according to what their interests are and what they, you know, what moves them. Um, so, uh, you know, whether it's writing letters to Congress people or being engaged in some local uh environmental organizations. I mean, it really has to do with, for, for me, it's like finding out what, what it is that moves you, that excites you, that's gonna keep you motivated and finding a local, uh, a local connection. Or an a lot of things that I've known that I should be doing, but haven't been. Randy, you know me a little better. What do you think I should be doing? Well, I would say to you the same thing that I would say to anyone else asking that question, which is be involved with two different ministry teams here. And one of them would be either uh, Building in Grounds or the Ministry for Earth, which both uh, address our physical space and how we care for it. And be involved with some other group where you can cross pollinate, because I think that uh, sometimes when we get in our our groups that really care about the environment and are doing meaningful stuff, like our the folks that deal with our permaculture garden, if they didn't engage in any other uh, ministries here, it would form this little silo and it would never it would never spread. But when you're involved with the community garden and also something else, and you're talking about the community garden when you're talking about other things, or you're talking about whatever you're doing environmentally with other people, then you can own that and also be a bit of an evangelist without needing them to necessarily agree with you and do everything that you do. But it's it's a part of who you are that you bring into other spaces. So I think that cross pollination is really important. Laura and Ken, do you have other questions? Uh, Jim, Laura's having some technical difficulties and uh, I'm going to sub for her here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think Ken is available. There's Ken. Um, yeah, I, I'm still here. Uh, We've got a lot of good questions from some people in the congregation that are uh, very environmentally active. Um, let's take them in order that they, they came in. Is that all right with you, Ken? It's fine. You okay. start at the beginning, I think. Okay. Uh, Susan asked, we have many religions, but only one Earth. Should Earth Day currently scheduled for April 22nd be designated with a religious emphasis? Not exactly sure what that means, but I'm hoping you, either of you, can respond. Well, I will say that um, a lot of environmental groups have recognized the value of including spirituality in what they are doing. Um, somebody has said that the environmental crisis is a crisis of values and religion is kind of where we learn our values and live out our values. I would hesitate to, to enforce any kind of spiritual connotation with Earth Day because I think that, um, I think people can approach that, that sort of celebration of the earth through a lot of different theological lenses. 
and leaving it open to people to, to be able to engage from their own personal values and their personal vantage point. I think it's more important to get a lot of people engaged in Earth Day than it is to say, this is a spiritual thing, because some people are going to just be turned off by making it a, a religious holiday. Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with Randy. And so I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> Might as well go to the next question. Mm -hmm. Kim? Okay, um, there's several questions. Many of them probably have been answered by our panelists. But one question is several conservative Christian ministers have stated that they oppose anti-climate change efforts and reject the idea of stewardship of the earth. Why? They claim this love of the natural world is idolatry, which makes us love nature above God. Your comments, thoughts on this? I mean, Randy, you, I'll, I'll just say something quick and then um, just, I mean, you know, when I first started doing um, my work in the Jewish world too, there were people who were afraid of of, a, of a, a relationship to nature because they were afraid of paganism and um, and they wanted to I you know identify themselves as different from pagans so um, that but that felt like 35 years ago I heard that a lot more I don't hear I don't hear it very much anymore so the paganism for for those people that were afraid and you know were, constructing these walls and wanting to separate themselves from paganism was because they, they saw paganism as connected to idolatry. That's, that's how they viewed the world. But so Randy can talk about the Christian piece. I can't, but I feel like in the Jewish world, it's that piece is much, we've overcome a lot of that problem and, and that, and that people are starting to really understand that our relationship to nature is this, this critical piece of life and not making that association with idolatry at all anymore. Well, I, I cannot pretend to know what is going on in someone else's mind, um, but I can say that in my experience, bad ideas never really go away. Mm. And I just have to have faith that the good ideas won't go away either. Mm. Um, there will always be people that disagree uh, on values. And if, if I have a strong value for the planet, there's gonna be somebody else that says, this planet doesn't matter. And trying to convince them otherwise, I think is, is a waste of my time. But I know that that opposition is going to be there. I do think that a lot of it comes down to, to feeling powerful and not wanting to feel powerless. I think that there are a lot of places in our society where people take a stand because it feels powerful to do so. And it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have integrity. It's not necessarily good in that sense of having integrity, um, but it's a reaction and it's a defensive anxious reaction against something that, that scares them and makes them feel like they may not have as much power if they don't take that stand. I don't know that that's what these ministers are, are doing, but, that's my suspicion. This, the same questioner has a follow-up question related. Do the panelists think that anti-climate change activism can be a means for an ecumenical coalition of liberal religious denominations on the environment? And does such a coalition exist? Can you, can you read the first part of that question again? Just the first part. Sure. Do the panelists think that anti-climate change activism can be a means for an ecumenical coalition of, liberal, of liberal religious denominations? Um, well, I'm not sure. Let me just say that there are lots of coalitions um, of, of religions working towards uh, healing our earth in lots of different ways. So there's green faith. I just became, uh, I'm now on the steering committee for third act faith. 
third act is was just was started for people over 60. Um, and it was started by Bill McKibben, um, one of America's great environmentalists. And um, it's so I'm on the steering committee of the faith group. It's people of all different faiths and uh, we're working together. So I think that I think there's there's a ton of interfaith stuff going on. There's interfaith power and light. That's a national organization. Um, so I, there's there's plenty of possibility of bringing faith groups together to uh, work towards um, the health of our earth. That's for sure. There's also the the Worldwide Fund for Nature has a Sacred Earth initiative that um, partners with faith groups to to do. Uh, conservation strategies, and that's. Um, I I think it's more important uh, to find local partnerships. I think that a lot of this stuff, um, if we're able to transform our local culture, our local environment, then that has a lot of um, that ripples. You know, that ripples out, and so being able to be in relationship with other faith communities in our area, uh, I think could be really meaningful. And I think there's a lot of space for those partnerships, because as we mentioned, there are liberal Jewish, liberal Christian, and other faith traditions that do revere the planet and, and feel a sense of responsibility toward it. And that's a great value to partner on, even if we disagree about other finer theological matters. <laughs> Ken, you have the next one? Yeah, I, this is from Nancy. It says the UU Green Sanctuary Program has pivoted to focus on climate justice and action. How is the Jewish, Jewish ecological perspective engaging people in the urgency of climate change and the fact that the impacts hit marginalized people first? Um, well, you know, it, it, it depends what synagogue you're, you're talking about or what group that you're talking about, but there's lots of, um, there's now lots of Jewish environmental organizations and you have a whole, um, host of organizations that are more farming, growing type organizations. The synagogue I used to belong to had, um, this farm that they shared with the, um, the homeless center next door. So, uh, and, and the, the, oh, it was a survival center. So the food from the farm would go to the survival center. There's lots of that kind of stuff going on in the Jewish world. Um, and then there's also the political advocacy, justice, um, environmental justice type work that's also going on. So I, I feel like you have these two different um, streams that are addressing um, climate change. Uh, before we go to the next one, um, I think Cliff Meyer is in Fellowship Hall. Cliff, are you there? And do you have any uh, live questions for us? Mm. Maybe not. And Cliff, are you there? Okay, there don't seem to be any. There's Cliff. Do you have anybody uh, with uh, questions? No? Okay, uh, let's go on. What uh, We have an, uh, several questions from anonymous attendees. Uh, and maybe you've already touched on some of these. Which religions are contributing more to diverse, I'm sorry, which religions are contributing more to drivers of envir environmental change and which groups or religions will probably experience the disproportionate impact of environmental degradation? Which religions will experience disproportionate impact of environmental degradation? That's an interesting question. Well, that is a huge question. Um, and I don't think that there are any religions 
in the broader sense that are better at environmental things than others. I think that it, there are pockets of environmental responsibility in, in most faith traditions. You can look at Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Christianity, Judaism. Uh, there's, there is a thread of environmental responsibility in, in every faith tradition that human beings have, have practiced. Um, but the people that are going to suffer the most are gonna be people in marginalized populations. So when we talk about environmental justice, we are not talking specifically about making sure that the, the ice caps don't melt. We're talking about justice in the sense that when we have lead in the water in, uh, in the Cleveland area, the people who are most likely gonna suffer for that are the people that, are, um, that have less means, the people who are in racially marginalized populations, the people who are, are not being cared for as well as folks that that have privilege. And so wherever you are in the world, uh, the people who are the most privileged are the ones who are going to suffer more. And that varies based on where you are. But environmental justice is saying that we're not just responsible to the planet, we're also responsible to the other human beings that suffer because we decide to treat the planet like it's our property. I don't know if that, I don't know if you agree with that or not, Ellen. Yeah, we haven't yeah. really talked about that. No, I totally, that's great. I'm uh, not, we, I, yeah, just assume that if I don't say anything, it means I totally agree with you. <laughs> you can before answer the I, next one first then. <laughs> before I go to the next question, you know, uh, what Wayne brought up, and I, it, rather than a specific religion, we may be talk, talking about politics, you know, how politics has, manipulated religion uh, as a wedge issue. But the next question, a recent Gallup poll said that over 80% of Democrats are very concerned about global warming and the climate. However, only 35% of Republicans are concerned. Do either of you think that most people recognize this environmental difference between the two parties? So, um, oh, I, I really appreciate this question. Um, and yeah, I think, I think lots of people recognize this difference, but what my, what my concern is, is that like, I'm very interested in environmental communication. And I think that if you were to ask, Repub if you were to frame this question differently and not use language of climate change, global warming, um, environmentalism, and instead used language about caring for your waterways and the air in your local community and um, solar energy, um, that you would get very different answers. And there, there's a whole, there's a school, there's several schools of environmental communication, and that's the kind of work that they do. And that, so that's another piece. I, I talked about this in the beginning about the arts as a way to engage people across the board, regardless of what your politics are, and that, and that the feeling piece is so important. Um, and I think that when we, you know, when we get hung up with stuff, these kind of studies that, that, um, um, that may speak more to a liberal audience, you're going to get it, get it to look like Republicans maybe or conservatives aren't caring about, about the earth. But, but I think you'll find if you ask different questions that people do care. Yeah, and when we talk about liberal religion, we're not talking about liberal of politics. We're talking about a religious tradition that is um, not a conservative tradition that's looking back to the past and trying to preserve a past that may or may not fit for the future that we envision. Liberal religious traditions are saying, here's the future that we envision for our culture, for our world, for our spirituality, and we're gonna move in that direction. We're gonna grow and change. Conservative religion says, here's what worked in the past. We're gonna make it work for us and it ought to work for everybody all the time. And those are two different ways of thinking about faith. It's not necessarily true that people who are liberal of politics are going to be in a liberal religious tradition. 
And it's not necessarily true that people who are in a liberal religious tradition are going to be Democrat. So, um, so we're talking about things that we we get we enmesh sometimes, but it's not it's not a given. So I think that as we look toward uh, our religious traditions, there are possibilities in any faith interpretation, in any spiritual interpretation, to find a relationship with the earth. As we talked about, Jainism is old. And there's a, a really firm sense of responsibility to the world around you when you are a Jain. And it, you don't have to have a progressive way of expressing Jainism for that to be true. So even conservative thinking can lead to environmental responsibility. So it doesn't have to be a disconnect, but I, I think we need to build the bridges if we want there to be bridges. Uh, an anonymous attendee makes a, a, a comment and a question that, that may be related to that. And this person says, I had a Bible teacher who essentially said, malevolent people will read the Bible malevolently. Benevolent people will read it benevolently. When all sides can claim a legitimate reading of the Bible, how do you respond? You want me to dive into that one, Ellen? Sure. Um, I had a seminary professor that said, scripture isn't scripture until someone says it is. And I think that as a Unitarian Universalist, what that has meant to me, this professor was not UU, but what it has meant to me is that where I find wisdom, uh, that can be scripture to me. But I know that other people are gonna find wisdom in other places. Whenever we read the Bible, we're reading it through the lens of interpreters. And in, a, in the Jewish tradition, Ellen mentioned that you, you read it through the, the lens of the rabbis, you know, and in Christian traditions, there are all of these different interpretations and translations and all of that stuff. There's a theological implication behind all of those words. And people are going to read it through the lens of their own personal theology. And that's just human beings. You know, whatever we read, we're going to read it through our own lenses. And it takes a lot of work to, to free ourselves from those lenses and to, to take a look at things differently. I think that is the work of the church, of any church, is to help people free themselves of their own unconscious kind of autopilot lenses and broaden their perspective so that they can deepen their sense of, of spiritual integrity. Not all churches do that, but I hope that I hope that more churches are able to. Um, I don't really believe in malevolent people, though, or benevolent people. Uh, I believe that everyone has inherent worth and dignity and that we might have some anxious ideas that lead us in dangerous, harmful directions. Um, but our anxiety is, I, I think, more to blame than being malevolent people. Rabbi Ellen, do you have any more to add to that? No, I, I love Randy's answer. <laughs> okay. Ken? Okay. Um, this is, I think, a question that was prompted by Reverend Ellen, uh, and it has to do with the environment and environmental justice, you know, quality of water and so forth. This question is, comes from Marlene. It's a comment, really, that there's a faith communities together or fact for sustainable future. And it's, it's a local faith Ohio group. And part of their issue is water quality, particularly where drilling occurs with fracking. And uh, I know in the Appalachian area and Southeastern Ohio, uh, some people have had to desert their homes because they can't drink water. Uh, any comments on this? Uh, you know, this is a faith-based group uh, that is looking at it and um, measuring the impact to people and where they live. So it was prompted probably by you, Ellen, you know, your comment about uh, environmental justice and people that maybe don't have the means to control their environment. But go ahead. I'm not sure if there's a question there. I, I didn't hear a question. 
Well, the question really is, do you have any comment? Uh, maybe it's a, a spinoff from your comment about uh, water quality and people um, that really don't have control of their uh, where they live. You know, uh, people of lesser means may be exposed to lead paint, uh, poor water quality. Randy brought this up about um, inner city in Cleveland. We don't have to go to southeastern Ohio, but do either of you have a comment regarding, uh, you know, this is a faith, multi-faith faith group that have come together to measure this. Some of the people in there are scientists, MDs. They have monitoring equipment uh, to um, measure what occurs in various environments, face-to-face uh, -face, um, interviews, with people that live in the area. Um, of course, Ohio is um, committed to fracking and oil drilling and injection wells, which is undermining part of the quality of our water that we drink. Um, I don't know if either of you want to comment on it, but that is a multi-faith based group. Well, are, so are people working towards political kind of change locally around um, cleaner water for, for everyone. I mean, I, I don't know enough to, you know, comment. to comment really. If there's a bunch of people getting together to do something good, I'm all for it. Right. Okay. And especially locally, it's, it's wonderful. You, you two have started us all going, I think. Thank you for a stimulating discussion. It's been great. We could listen to you all afternoon, but I think I'm sure Randy has something else he's he's supposed to be doing, and Ellen, you probably have other responsibilities too. Um, see, I've got a closing uh, comment here. This forum has been recorded and will soon be available on our congregation website. That's uucleveland.org uucleveland.org. You can always join our Sunday uh, forums uh, online by going to our website and clicking on the specific forum for that day. You can also click on former recording uh, forums you're interested in. We want to invite all of you to join our Unitarian service at 11 o'clock this morning, which we're crowding, crowding out. So I understand that the title, title will be Let's Get It Done. And Reverend Partain will explore a fundamental concept of our faith tradition. If you can't join today's service, you can go to the website and click on the YouTube icon. You can also go to our, red, our Facebook page, Univer Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. Our next forum is next Sunday, uh, March 6th. It will be on homelessness. How does it happen and what's happening? We w appreciate your continued support and think you'll enjoy our forum on homelessness. Thank you for joining us today. Wayne, it's all yours.